Hey there, it's Angela. We are in between podcast seasons right now, but I wanted to release this episode, which is an excerpt from an interview that I did with Lisa Woodruff of Organize 365 for her Organize 365 podcast. Um, I have been on her show before. She's been on my show before, and I know a lot of you have really enjoyed our collaboration. Um, Lisa and I are so aligned when it comes to organizational methods, work-life balance, all of those good things. And honestly, Lisa's just a good time. She's just really fun to listen to. She's so energetic and positive. And I just thought this might be something fun for you to listen to this summer. We're just talking about um, what's happening in education in terms of the support that teachers need in order to stay um, and the things that she's doing, the things that I'm doing and the overlap between them in order to support teachers. So she has what she calls an Education Friday work box, and you can find the link to that in the show notes for this episode. That's her organizational system. Um, for teachers. And when we first started partnering together, we realized that like the 40 hour teacher work week is so compatible with her Education Friday work box, but there's no overlap between her process and mine. So if you're in one program and not the other, like you won't see things duplicated, but at the same time, they really, the whole mindset and the approach really complement each other. So we talk a bit about that as well. So I just wanted to um, let you all listen in on this. I encourage you to check out her podcast too. She's got lots of great organizational tips. They're really focused on home organization. And I know a lot of people like to work on that sort of thing and other home projects over the summer. So enjoy and I will be back to talk with you again soon. We're both very solution oriented, positive people but I'm going to take a few minutes of this podcast to pour a little bit of salt on the wound and really get to the crux of what is the state of education today for teachers? Like what is coming out in some of the surveys that we've seen in the last year? What really is happening? And then we will talk about the solution. So the first one I want to really talk about is the National Education Association, the NEA, is the National Teachers Union. So it's the largest group of teachers that you can survey. And they did a survey that they released in February that they did in January. And they revealed that 55% of teachers were looking to retire sooner than they had before in the previous fall. That same body did a survey back in the fall and the statistic was 25%. That is a huge increase of the number of teachers that are expected to leave the profession. Natural attrition for teachers every single year is 8%. So there is a natural attrition to teachers, but there is a a definite lack of teachers in the classroom right now being able to take a sick day, being able to leave for a doctor's appointment because there are no subs and in the buildings are short staffed. There's definitely a lack of teachers out there. Now, interestingly, I was sharing the statistic with a business group that I'm in, a bunch of other CEOs not in the education industry, and two of them had spouses that were in the education industry, and they said, we saw that study, and actually, January and February were really bleak times in the education industry in general of 2022. They said even our spouses were thinking about leaving in 20, you know, in the beginning of 2022, but then COVID started to abate, and the mask mandate got lifted, and now teachers are much more you know, ready to stick in the fight. I think it, it, it was a poorly timed study that got some of those really high returns of more than one in two teachers saying they're like, yeah, I'm going to get out of this sooner rather than later. But still, there are a lot of teachers that are rethinking their profession. There are a lot of nurses that are rethinking their profession. There are a lot of these Emergency responders, first line responders who literally have been running for a full two years and never stop to think about if they like a four day work week or if they don't want to return to the office yet or if they don't feel comfortable. like there. None of these questions have ever been asked of nurses and teachers. They've been in the front lines. They have been running the entire two years and they are starting to come up for air in the summer and they're going, I don't know if I could do it again. Yep. I don't know. Yep. What are you hearing? Yes, the same thing that, you know, these past two summers were simply not long enough for teachers to recover from the toll that trying to Mm -hmm. teach in a pandemic and all of the additional demands and stresses. So they just haven't been able to recalibrate, to re-energize, to refocus. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much unpredictability, which makes it really hard. So, you know, I do think that there are a lot of educators who are 
thinking about leaving, I also, anytime I talk about this, I always want to mention the percentage of teachers who are happy and thriving, because I think those folks are afraid to say anything right now. They see so many of their colleagues struggling and they're like, I don't want to say it, but like, I'm actually really happy. My kids are for the most part doing well. We're making good progress. It feels like a fairly normal school year and we're doing great, but they don't want to rub that in the, in the faces of all the teachers who are Mm -hmm. suffering because I mean, the thing with COVID is, you know, we, as the saying goes, we were all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. And some yes. people were in luxury yachts and some people were, you know, paddle boarding <laughs> through the ocean. So, you know, we've all had very, very different experiences. Schools have been impacted in different ways. Our families have been impacted in different ways. There's no one singular experience. And it has taken the toll on people in very different ways. They're responding in very different ways. But I am always just super encouraged to hear that there are teachers that are happy too, because I think it gives you hope. You know, if you think everybody's miserable, everybody's quitting, then what am I a sucker for staying? Like, why should I even bother to try this Mm -hmm. if it's such an impossible job? It's not. It is not an impossible job. There is hope. There are teachers who are happy. There are teachers who are finding work-life balance. And I am forever uh, optimistic about the future of our schools and that we can reimagine the way that we've done things and come out of this even stronger than we were before and fix some of these problems that were going on way before COVID came and really get to the heart of some issues. So I'm I'm not going to stop fighting. <laughs> I will keep no. fighting that battle to the end. And I know you will too. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But I do think to voice both teachers' views is important to recognize there are teachers that are like, yeah, I didn't. Well, let's be clear. There is not a single teacher on the planet that got into education because they thought they were going to hit the lottery or they thought it was going to be easy. Like right. no teacher was like, you know what I think would be a cakewalk profession teaching. <laughs> and I think I'll make a mint and I'll be able to do it. Like that's not the kind of person that is drawn into the teaching field to begin with. They are very industrious, hardworking, lifelong learners who enjoy teaching and learning. Like these are the people. So they're like, the puzzle just got bigger. I will solve the puzzle. I will figure it out. Um, But there is a point where where it is untenable and you cannot keep going the way you are. And that's why we are airing this in the summer while you have this breath, this minute away from school and give you some resources to help you. So another study I wanted to share is, was done by Ed Weeks, I think it's Education Week, but it's EDW, Ed Week. Is it Ed Week? I don't know. Mm -hmm, They mm -hmm. did, uh, they have a research center and they surveyed 1,300 teachers and they found that the teachers were working on average 54 hours a week. Half of that time was devoted to instruction and half of that time was devoted to non-teaching time. Not 26 hours a week of non-teaching time. Now, Angela, this has been, you know, the hill you've staked your claim on years and years and years ago. That's where the 40 hour teacher work week came from. You've done informal surveys or maybe formal surveys of your audience as well. When they come into your program, how many hours a week are they putting into their teaching profession? So yeah, we have uh, run informal studies and we have had formal studies done. And Honestly, 54 hours a week sounds less than what I would have anticipated. Now, granted, the people that we're asking are people who are interested in a program to help them work fewer hours. So maybe we skew a little high, but our average uh, is 62 hours a week. And I don't think that's unreasonable for a lot of educators. That sounds pretty on target (laughs) to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was reading some meme or something and they're like, teaching is the only profession where you work in order to go to work and then you leave work to work. And I was like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, it's also expected, you know, it's Mm -hmm. expected that when you go into the profession that, you know, this is not going to be a done at three o'clock kind of job. And unfortunately, because there are people who are, you know, in it for a purpose and for a calling and to make a difference you know, they're willing to go above and beyond. But I think what we've seen happen is that that has been, you know, sort of taken advantage of, you know, and in the same way that, as you mentioned with nurses, you know, their goodwill and their deep care about their work um, is propping up an underfunded system. And it's now dependent upon, you know, really stretching them beyond their capacity. So I love this idea of really thinking about when am I going to purposely not think about work that that is a new concept for many oh, teachers. Idea. Like those, those boundaries between work and life are just, they overlap so much. And 
that's the norm. And not only in this profession, but really in the culture. Yes. And when I went into direct sales or I went into entrepreneurship, I mean, I took all those habits with me and I worked like all the hours. I I didn't pick any hours that I didn't work. It wasn't until recently that I have full-time 40 hour week employees that I, you know, and I don't email on the evenings and the weekends and call late meetings. I I don't do any of those things that a quote unquote bad employer would do, but I do think all of the time. And so I've had to train myself not to even send the email because even if you send the email, they're going to reply. I'm like, why are you working? I know why I'm working, but why are you working? They're like, well, you sent the email. Like, it has been a, a huge unlearning that I have purposely done in the last 18 months to get better with my own boundaries. Well, for sure, my boundaries for my team. Like I will protect their boundaries before mine. But now I'm starting to realize like this summer, I'm I'm working less. I'm not working in the evenings. I'm not working weekends. It's really weird. I will tell you that it's, <laughs> I'm needing more hobbies. I am so used to just doing the next thing at home and in work. It's hard for me to stop myself. And I've never had that employee mentality that I get paid for each hour that I work. I don't earn a dollar per hour. I earned a salary. Right. You see what I'm saying? And so, and so as a teacher, we don't really equate each of our hours to the dollar that we earn. Don't do the math people. Please don't do the math. It's yeah, sad. that's right. And so I've heard sad. from more teachers that that is actually the wake up call for them when they realize, mm-hmm. you know, I'm working 60 some hours a week. That means if I'm working 65 and I'm only paid for 40. I gave the school yes. 25 hours of my yeah. family and personal time, time that I could have been with my friends, that I could have been taking care of myself physically. I could have been pursuing hobbies. I could have been doing all of these other things that are on my to do list. I could have been mm-hmm. sleeping and I gave it away for mm-hmm. free. Because the thing is, even though you are salaried, you do have contractual hours, you know, like I was required to be at school from 730 until three. So technically those are the only hours I have to work. I don't have to work on evenings and weekends. It just would end up being that way sometimes because the job really wasn't designed to be fit within those hours. Right. But I think it's super important, even for salaried employees to remember if you are expected to show up at work at a certain time and stay until a certain time, then even though you're not being paid an hourly rate, you are still, you still have contractual hours that you do not have to go beyond. And if you are going beyond them, you're working for free because you get paid the same, whether you're working the 40 hours or the 65, your paycheck does not reflect Mm -hmm. all of that overtime. And so you really have to make a choice about how you want to be spending your time. There may be things that it's like, you know what, if I stay an hour late, I'm going to feel so much more prepared tomorrow. I'm just going to do it. That's fine. Um, But it's important to just be really intentional with the trade-offs and not to just try to work until everything's done because it's never all going to be done. Yeah. The hard part, Angela, is that we're held accountable for all the things that happen during non-teaching hours. Like we're legally even held responsible. Like they, these things need to get done. So you can't always say no, like, okay, you're contra- already. I'm thinking like, that's great, Angela. I'm still going to work till five and I'm going to work Saturday, Sunday, because I'm going to get the IEP report done. I'm going to get the grading done. I'm going to like, I can't get it done in contracted hours. So I'm going to work the hours because I'm not in control of the flow of the amount of work I have to do. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Teachers, many, many teachers think that way. And there's a lot of validity to that because the majority of what's on teachers' work plates is not an option. Um, right. I think it's really important to identify what, where are the areas that I am overcomplicating things. Yes. Um, I'm creating more work for myself. Yes. I may be, you know, if, if you know it's going to take you 15 hours to grade a stack of essays, then you can't assign an essay every single week. When are you ever going to yeah. grade it? You're going to have to rethink some of your planning process, your assessing process. Like there are definitely ways that you can streamline your processes and save yourself many hours a week. I would say up to five, 10 hours a week, just uh, simplifying or eliminating certain tasks. But when it comes to the stuff, give us the top three, you got to give us the top three. Like, (laughs) okay, just off the top of your head, what's three things that you see teachers do? They're like, oh yeah, that'd be easier for me. It'd be like putting all the little bubbles on the end of every stick when you're doing printing. Do you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) <laughs> like I used to always do this. Like when I would write it, then you put little bubbles at the end so that it looks like it's a font, even though it's your yeah. handwriting. So yeah, certainly stop, there stop are dotting things. Yes, yeah, certainly there are times when we're spending more time doing things that look fancy, right? So yes. in 40 hour, we call this the difference between hobby work and yes. required work. So the required work is that you teach this lesson tomorrow. 
Um, you may feel like, okay, the best way to do that is to have the slideshow. I need to have, you know, these slides to be able to show the kids the information. But if you want to spend hours coming up with little memes that you can put in there and playing with the fonts and all that kind of stuff, that's hobby work. That's something you're mm-hmm. doing because it's fun for you. It's something creative. It's relaxing. It's enjoyable. So start to notice, okay, if I've already been working, you know, I've already been in school for eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours today, is this required or is this hobby work? So really getting clear on that, I think is important. One of the main places that I tell teachers to think about is um, figure out how many assignments you are actually required to assess in a week. There are many teachers who have never even thought about this. For me, every, I've taught in three different districts and at the elementary level, each time it was two grades per subject per week, two math grades, two reading grades, two science grades, two social studies, two writing grades. So that's 10 grades a week. So why am I grading 10 stacks of papers a day? I don't need to do all of that. The district is not making me do that. So if I have stories and I'm telling myself like, oh, I need to, this, how am I going to get the kids to um, be accountable? How am I going to get them to do their work if I don't grade it? Uh, How will I know how they're doing if I don't give a, a formal uh, great. There's so many other ways to answer those questions. There's so many ways to to monitor student learning, to do informal assessment, to give feedback without giving a formal grade. Really thinking about how many grades you are taking and how many assignments you're giving is huge because most teachers are giving way too much work. It's too much for the kids mm-hmm. to do and it's too much for them to grade. And it's because wow. they feel this pressure, you know, to do it all. And I understand the pressure. But this is where you really have to focus on what's going to make a difference. If you have, you know, three assignments, let's talk about math, for example, because math is something where you tend to do the same thing over and over again for practice. You know, if, if I'm giving them three similar assignments this week, do I need to grade all three of them? And do they need, do they really need all three? Maybe they don't. Can they demonstrate mastery after one? And then they don't have to do the rest. Like just thinking more outside the box instead of just doing things the way we've always done them can help so much with the streamlining. Mm-hmm. That's great. Hobby work versus actual work. Because when we were talking about all this, I was like, but I really like to do the lesson plans. Mm-hmm. And I really liked to like go through my notebook and redo my sheets and like, and that is hobby work. I mean, my teaching was as much a passion as it was actually my income. So Just knowing that, oh yeah, I'm going to go do hobby work. I would say I do a lot of organized 365 hobby work. This Mm -hmm, week I redid mm -hmm. a whole journal. Like there's no ROI on that for the team. Like it was totally just something I wanted to do, but my family saw it as work. It wasn't really work. It was like entrepreneurial hobby work. I love that. Yes. And, and, you know, the family connection is really important there because a lot of teachers feel guilt about neglecting whoever it is at home, whether it be, you know, a friend, a partner, a roommate, children, you know, an elderly parent they're supposed to be caring for the family, whoever it is they live with sees them as working all the time. Yes. They don't know the difference between, you know, I'm on deadline for these report cards and, you know, I just felt like making these fun games for my students. They don't see it any different. So really getting clear in your own head and telling the people around you, like I will tell my husband, sometimes I am interruptible right now. Like you, I'm in my office, I'm on my computer, but I'm just messing around with things and having a good time. Feel free to come in, talk to me whenever, like we really try to keep those doors of communication open so that he knows like when I'm really trying to concentrate and when I'm not, because that can be another big strain with the hobby work is it's something that we're doing that's fun for us, but it appears that we're working all the time. And it can also be this kind of situation where you feel like I I don't need to distinguish between hobby work and required work because it's something that I still feel like I have to do. So many educators have gone into the field because they love to be creative and, or they're really passionate about their subject matter. And when you enjoy creating new things, or you're really excited about this concept, you are going to want to spend extra time, you know, creating these little videos and activities and this and that. And it's really a fun thing to do. And as we have seen the creativity being sucked out of the teaching profession over the last couple of decades, I feel like that's even more true. I used to be able to get my creativity fix just from regular daily routines with kids because I had so much more autonomy than a lot of teachers are given now. The hobby work is the only time that some teachers are able to be creative and have fun Mm -hmm. and really get into that passion for that project Mm -hmm. or the subject area. So I never want to take away teachers hobby work. If you want to just like dive all in on your ancient civilizations unit and just have a ball, you know, creating these, you know, pyramid models, go for it. Do the thing that still keeps you passionate, but just be aware 
of how much time it's taking up and what your opportunity cost is. What are you saying no to? So you can say yes to that and making sure that the other people in your life that you care about are cool with that, that they know, okay, this is something that I really enjoy doing. And I want to spend my evening like this. Is that okay with you? And that you don't, they don't feel neglected by you or feel like all you ever do is work because there's nothing worse than being told, you know, you're never around or I can never count on you. or I never see you. You never do anything with me anymore. Like that kind of guilt, I think probably every teacher has faced at some point. And so really getting clear on hobby work can help with that. So this hobby work, I like to press into this a little more. I want to take Mm -hmm. it a different direction. I would say that I definitely did hobby work, but also I would take my work to a level of excellence versus a level of good enough. And I did this for two reasons. One, because I wanted to have excellence and I was a younger teacher, but two, I was usually under administrators that were very exacting and perfectionistic. So if they ever showed up in the classroom, they immediately saw what wasn't done or what wasn't perfect. And then they would judge you on that or they would write it up or whatever. I, For whatever reason, I, I usually was under someone who was very authoritarian. And so I was always trying to have everything perfect so that when they came in, there would be nothing that they could see that was wrong. Now, let me just tell you, they always found something wrong. Mm-hmm. So perfection <laughs> is not a thing. It's, it's just not a thing. And... I'm thinking about the slides you're talking about, making the slides and finding the right meme. If you're submitting the slides to your administrator to look at, they're always going to give you something that you could do better because they are, you know, educating and helping you improve as well. The students don't notice any of that. Like you could take it like to 50% of that level and they're still going to love it. Especially if you throw Mm -hmm. a a cartoon in there, they think they're going to think it's great. They don't care if the font is different on each slide. They don't care if you forgot to put a period there. Like They're not going to notice. Your kids are not going to notice when they're going through the content. They just want to know, what do I need to know that's on the test? And if you can make learning more fun, they want learning to be more fun. But I was also, so that was one reason why I was trying to make things perfect. The other reason why I was trying to make things perfect was because I was under this grand delusion that if I could get this lesson plan done optimally, the next year it was going to be easier for me because I was going to be able to recycle these lessons. And it mm. never happened, not even one single year, because every single year I had a different class with different students in it, a different grade, a different building, a different co teacher, a different team, a different. Like I only retaught math twice and four year old preschool twice. That's it. That's all I ever retaught for a second year in a row. And yeah, that second year was maybe 10, 20% easier, but it wasn't like I could do it on autopilot. It wasn't like I was a fifth grade teacher for 25 years. And even if you're a fifth grade teacher for 25 years, like you are not teaching today what you taught five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you read a new book, you went to a new conference, you have new teachers. Like this idea that I can do more work now so that I could do less work later didn't seem to work for me in teaching. Yes. Oh, I'm really glad you brought that up because you know what I flashed back to this time when I was teaching in um, Fort Lauderdale, we got new state standards. Oh, I had to write them on gosh. the board. And that was when this was a new thing. Yes. Teachers had not been yes. required to do that before. Yes. And so I thought, well, I don't want to write them on the board. What I will do to save myself time in future years <laughs> is I will write them on chart strips, display them in a chart strip holder. Yes. And then I can just pull them out. So I spent, you don't want to know how many hours writing all of these standards, you know, math was in green and science is in yellow and blah, blah, blah. I bought a little organizer, bot, put them in the organ, beautiful, great. Guess how long those standards lasted? One year, one year. And then we went to common core. This is like when you, as the parent have decided you've had it with the Legos. And so you're going to organize them all by color so that they won't be messed up anymore. Cause I did this. It took me six weeks. (laughs) Six weeks, we had so many Legos. And then the first thing Joey said was, this is boring. I like them when they're mixed. And he poured them in together. Just about lost it. I just, but this is, this is what we do at home. This is what we do in work. This is what we do as teachers. This is what we do as parents. We keep thinking, you know what? I am so overwhelmed. This is so much work. This is so much chaos. I know how I'll, what I'll do. I will create this great system and then I'll be able to duplicate it. It doesn't work in parenting. It does work in housework, does not work in teaching. Like give up the ghost for crying out loud. It's just, and it's fun Mm -hmm. when you start the chart paper Mm -hmm. exercise. Halfway through, you're like, well, I'm halfway through. Now I got to finish it, right? Yes, 
yes, exactly. Like, uh, I'll, I'll be, it'll be so good when it's done. Yes. And it really wasn't. Cause you know what? Then I had to dig through the chart strip box and find, find the right one. I'm yes. like, you know what? When I look at how long that took and you know what else I did, which now I really regret is I laminated them. Yes. So that Everything that doesn't time. move, we yes. laminate, then you've got to cut it out. But first you had to color yes. it. Oh my gosh. Yes. So, yes. Much so I time. spent all that time in a laminator, all the time cutting it out. Now all of that plastic, those chart strips, I threw them away. I don't know how many years ago, they're still sitting in a landfill. They will like never yeah. biodegrade because they're plastic. So I like killed the earth for absolutely no reason. I spent probably 20 hours of my time that I could have been doing something that was either more enjoyable in my personal life or something that actually made an impact for kids that made zero impact for my students, mm-hmm. me having those perfectly organized chart strips. But I thought I was going to be saving myself time later. And I, what in retrospect, what I realized was I should have weighed the cost ahead of time. I should have really mm. thought out how long is it going to take me to do this versus putting them on the board every single day, or maybe just start off the year with that and see if a better system occurs to me, you know, like one thing that maybe I would try now is have a student write them. I, I was thinking the say, same thing. Yeah. I'm like, that sounds like yes. it's delegated still. I, I would always have kids who would show up to class a few minutes early. They would be there before the bell ring. Let the kid come into class five minutes early, right on the board. In third grade, they would think that's the coolest thing in the world. Honestly, yes. I think even middle and high school kids, there were certain personalities who would enjoy that. Let them write it. It's in their handwriting. Now they have ownership of it. And I didn't have to think about it. All I had to do was just point it out and say, write this one, this one, this one from, you know, whatever printout or whatever poster, whatever else I had, I could have had a poster printed out and circled or highlighted the ones next to it. Like maybe laminate the poster and then like, you know, put an arrow next to the one or, or circle, or I don't know, put a sticky note next to that one. There's so many other ways I could have done that, that were more efficient, but I just had it in my head that this was going to save me time later. And to go back to what you were saying earlier about the perfectionism, I mean, it was, it was beautiful. That was like, you know, what administrator wouldn't be thrilled to come in there and and see that. (laughs) Uh, Cameo for those of you that are watching from YouTube. Hey, I need my credit card. (laughs) I'm recording a podcast. Joey just came in, gave me a hug and he walked out the door and I didn't get the credit card. All (laughs) righty, then that's not good. Amanda, just leave that in the podcast. That is real life. See, you work, (laughs) your kids just work with you. So I think, you know, I'm going to keep going back to this probably for the rest of my life now because of COVID. We had somebody cleaning our house, couldn't clean our house when COVID started. It wasn't until week seven that all of a sudden the dust accumulated everywhere. From weeks one to six, no dust whatsoever. If you're dusting every week, every two weeks, every month, you're dusting too often. You only need to dust your house every six weeks. And then you'll stay above it and you'll never see the dust. There are things like this that we are doing in education too, that either we've always done them, they looked cool on TV. I I don't know why we do them. There are things that we do that we think other teachers are doing or that we need to do that really either don't need to be done at all, can be done by somebody else, can be done less frequently. But we don't often are able to stop and put our head above the water and start to think through. So, So Angela... This is the prime opportunity. It's the middle of June and July. Hey guys, I'm getting the credit card in case anybody (laughs) was worried on the podcast. Thanks, Joey. (laughs) It's in his car. So you can, when you're like, oh yes, I've got this time this summer to do things on my house, to do things on my family, to do things for me and to prepare for the next school year. As you're all excited to prepare for the next school year. Like I actually want to prepare for the next school year for you because I miss it. Mm -hmm. What, when you go to do this project, Think through, okay, how long is this going to take? What impact is this going to make? What am I not going to be able to do because I'm choosing to do this? And it could be that I'm not going to be able to add new trade books to all of my units because I'm writing chart strips. It could be I'm not going to be able to go to the pool four more times with my friends, with my kids, with my neighbors because I'm in the house cutting out laminated chart strips. Or it could be like, no, we've been doing this for five years. I've always wanted to do this. This is a big thing that I want to do. I know I'm going to stay in this grade and this is something I'm going to do. I want to invest the time to do it and go ahead and go forward and do it. Mm -hmm. But thinking through how much time, how much cost and what's the opportunity cost? What, What could I be doing with this time that I'm not doing this time because I'm choosing to do this? Yeah, and you're you hit the nail on the head. That is exactly what, Teachers do not have time to do during the school year. And often during the summer, summers get busy too. You may have a second job, you're doing PD, 
you've got caretaking duties, you know, the summers go by really fast. And there's sometimes the lack of structure is really hard for people too. They find that they just, you know, nothing gets done because they didn't have their regular routine. So there's all kinds of reasons why even summer can be really difficult, but it's a great time to start this habit of really being intentional with your time so that you can carry it over into the new school year. It's very hard to start something like that in August, which is just like a, a really kind of nutty month. Um, to start it in June or July and just start to be really intentional about, okay, what are the things that I want to do today? What can I realistically get done? (laughs) And that's why I recommend uh, for 40 hour members that they use a prioritized to-do list. So um, there's a section for morning, a section for afternoon, a section for evening. So you don't just have this list of 50 things you're doing during the day. You're deciding, you know, the night before or that morning you're looking to see, okay, what am I going to get done this morning? What in the afternoon? What in the evenings? And so, you know, if you're making mm-hmm. this list at 7 a.m. and you've got 25 things, they can all get done that morning. You're going to have to space them out. And I think being really intentional about when you plan, when you're going to do things helps. Because if you just say, I'm going to do it today, the day just flies by. You have mm-hmm. to decide what time of day. And then you can see, okay, well, if I put in clean out the garage, well, then I'm not going to go... That's a, a, that's the whole day. That's not just the morning. Number one, number two, I'm going to be tired afterwards. I'm not going to want to cook. I'm not going to want to clean. I'm not going to want to do any of that stuff. So anything that I assign to myself for that evening, if I have to assign anything for that evening, I should let myself rest if Mm -hmm. possible should be something I can do while laying down, sitting down, you know, something on the computer, something that is not physically demanding. Like it forces you to really analyze what your energy levels are like during the day, what's possible, what's not possible. And then you don't end every single day feeling like, I didn't get everything done. I was supposed to, and now Mm -hmm. I'm starting the next day behind. You're being really intentional upfront about what could I realistically get done today and not over scheduling yourself because it feels awful to be constantly behind. Yeah. I think boy have not only teachers, but anybody listening has really gotten some good things to think about. Like, are you doing hobby work? Are you trying to reach a level of excellence instead of a level of done? Like, who are you doing this for? Are you doing it for you? Are you doing it for an administrator? Are you doing it for some invisible thing that's judging you? That's not even judging you. Like, why are you doing what you're doing and really be more conscious about the work and the choices that you do versus reactive to what you think is being expected of you. So if Ed week says that teachers are reporting that they're working 52 hours a week and Angela, your audience is saying that they're working 62 hours a week. What do you notice after educators go through the 40 hour teacher work week. It's a mouthful. What do they notice? I know I'm, I always want to say, 40, I always want to say it wrong. So I'm trying Just to say 40 it hour, the 40 hour after they go through the 40 hour program, like how soon do they start to see results? How many hours are dropping off? Like what, what have you noticed of people who, that you've been able to follow through? Yeah. So uh, we've done a lot of surveys with our members and we found that most of them are able to take off at least five hours off their work week that very first month, like right right away, they're able to do that. And then it's just sort of uh, compounds over time because you, you start off with one set of habits and then the next month you learn about some new habits. And then the next month you add some more on and each month has a different focus. So one month is on lesson planning and we work on, work on how to streamline that. Another month is on grading. Let's get that streamlined. Another is on time management for kids. So really maximizing uh, your instructional time with students, helping them keep on task, helping them keep up with deadlines, you know, dealing with makeup work, missed work, all that kind of stuff. So each month you have a different area of focus. And when you add those together, I think that's what really helps create permanent change. But teachers can see results right away just by even some of the things that we've talked about so far. Yes, that's what we noticed with the Sunday basket as well. When you start the Sunday basket within the first six weeks, you consistently have an extra five hours each week of bandwidth and reduced mental overwhelm. Wow. Um, I think that is interesting. You know, you start piling these together. And that's the other thing, like there is no magic wand. You can't buy a special planner or buy any of these programs. And all of a sudden you're going to only be working 40 hours a week. Um, education is not really a 40 hour a week job, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a 62 or 52 hour a week job either. You can have a little bit more say in that. I think that finding a quick win, you know, five hours equivalent of maybe losing 10 pounds. You're like, okay, this is working. I can eat salads a day for a while because I'm seeing some progress. You'll see some immediate progress, but then ultimately your weight, your finances, your productivity are all a result of consistent 
daily habits, small micro changes that you make, different ways that you start to see the world that compound over time to lead to a debt-free lifestyle, a healthy weight and energy level, a more realistic work schedule that you feel a little bit more in control of and less reactionary to does not happen overnight. Um, one of the things I love about the Organized 365 programs, I'm so excited that you agree with this as well. Your programs are also lifetime purchase. When you make the purchase, you have the purchase for life. I love that because I did it because as a female, whenever I buy things, I try to be as proactive as possible. But if my house, my spouse, my kids, my whatever, like when, when people need things of me, I change my schedule to meet other people's needs. And so because I do that, if I sign up for a program or whatever, I may sign up and the next day something happens in my family that I'm called to do that. And I can't do the program I just signed up for. I like being able to go back and do it over and over again. What I love in Organize 365 is, oh my gosh, you guys, you guys are still doing this eight years ago. You're like, yeah, yes. I signed up for this eight years ago and I'm going through, this is my 19th round. And yep. like, Here's what I'm doing now. And like, it's so awesome. It, it's so awesome that you can do it that often, but also yeah. it's really, really impactful for those that are just starting yeah. to see people who are still excited about growing these habits and how far people have come and, and the mentoring and encouragement you give to brand new people who've just decided to join. Yeah. If you don't have a lifetime program and people are always just joining you each round, everybody's new all the time. Everybody's overwhelmed and anxious when they join and they're not sure if they're going to get through it in time. And all of that is eliminated when you have programs that are lifetime. They're much more like Montessori education where, mm -hmm. oh, welcome to the party. Here's what we're doing. By the way, my first round, that's exactly what I saw too. And you just, you just keep going and you just have these people that now you can do life with and grow and develop your skills together. So I personally did it because I didn't want the pressure on myself or my audience to be able to complete a program. The benefits of having lifetime access to everything I offer have been so much greater than I ever even anticipated when I first did that. I think it's so cool to see people who work back through the program, like two, three, four, five times, yes. you know, and I hear teachers who say, I go back and I look at the back to school resources in 40 hour every single August. And it makes yeah. me so happy because I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I could have released what I'm doing as a book. People have asked me before, like, do you have a book? Cause yeah. a book is like, cheaper. And, you know, theoretically you could read it in a weekend, but I'm like, it's not that this is not how change to your yeah. organizational habits and your time management works. I have mm -hmm. read so many books on productivity and organization and ask me what was in them a week later. You know, some of it will, some of it will get into my head. It will change my thinking, but it's so much more powerful when I then listen to a podcast by that author every single mm -hmm. week. Or, you know, I'm enrolled in some sort of ongoing course, or there's a community around it where we're discussing this kind of stuff every single day. Like you need follow-ups and reminders mm -hmm. and you need layers because some things I, I've heard five times before yeah. it really sunk in, you know, there were certain productivity principles that I'm like, yeah, I, I just can't seem to make it work. I don't know if that's really good for me. And then like the sixth or seventh time I heard someone talk about, it, I was like, oh, oh, that's how that could work. So that mm -hmm. repeated exposure is so important and hearing from other people who have been through the same process and who are different places in the process, as you were saying, that's how I feel like permanent change is created because it really is about these consistent daily habits. Mm -hmm. And if you're not surrounded by other people who are thinking the same way that you are and those kinds of influences in your life, it's just too easy for it to be a one and done. Yeah. I mean, you could buy a treadmill. Yes, <laughs> you can yes. buy things, but to actually, you know, walk an extra 2000 steps every day is so much easier. If all of you and your teacher friends are going to meet at, at school 15 minutes early and go around the building two times before you start your day, or, you know, at recess, you're going to walk the playground versus stand on the playground and you have kids walking with you or whatever, like it habit changes happen better in community than they yes. do in isolation. It takes a lot of willpower and direction to do things on your own. You can, I mean, you mm -hmm. totally can, mm -hmm. but sometimes that accountability and that community really helps you. But also the 40 hour teacher work week is not the same program today as it was two years ago, six years ago, eight years ago. Same with right. everything in organized 365. We're teachers, Angela and I are teachers. So we're going to constantly be iterating and changing and adding and growing and I love that I have the freedom to do that as a teacher and I don't worry about it. 
Mm -hmm. You bought in whenever you bought in and you'll keep getting whatever I add to it. And so I'm allowed to keep reorganizing and creating and making all these programs the best that they can possibly be, knowing that you have access to whatever that I'm creating. It gives me freedom as the course creator. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if we could still go to all those classes that we had in college? Like, wouldn't you love to be able to retake some of those classes or be able to see how they're changing it and just being able to audit it or download certain, like, like this lifelong learning to, to be able to absorb that information and move on when it is your profession and your career, it's nice to be able to go back and refresh yourself Mm -hmm. because we do want to be people of excellence. Yes. One of the things that we had a teacher workbox before we took it away and now we've come back with the education workbox. Our education workbox is for all educators from early childhood education, daycare centers, elementary schools, high schools, community colleges, uh, professors, PhDs. Like we tried to create something that would be for the entire education community and not just for teachers, because most of what teachers struggle with is all of the administrative requirements that keep coming down not actually how to teach students. Like they know how to teach students. And if you look at, again, the Ed Week, I think it was the Ed Week survey, they said the number one thing that teachers wanted to spend less time on was, was administrative tasks. And the top two things that they wanted to spend more time on were planning and teaching. And so teachers don't mind planning time because they're planning their creativity, like you said, and how they're going to present their lessons. It's the administrative tasks that are required and necessary and important that tend to take up a lot of time because they're not creative and they're reactive. And there's not really a good system anywhere to organize any of that administrative stuff. It's not even taught in universities at all. Mm. So when we were recreating the education workbox, there really was almost no overlap between your program, Angela, and the Organized 365 program, but we took the lesson planning component completely out of the education workbox because it's covered in the 40 hour, 40 hour teacher work week. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And we made the education one completely administrative. It's just completely administrative. There is a category in there for students, like for you to keep student work, but there is no lesson planning or grading, which used to be in the teacher workbox. And part of why I did that is because then it would be more accessible to anyone in education, especially administrators, principals, grade level, like anyone inside of education, but also because we really wanted our product to be a perfect complement to your product, knowing that we have so much overlap in our audiences. Right. And as you said, there's, it it is amazing when we compared our two programs to see like, (laughs) were we contradicting each other or anything, or were you doing any of the same things that I was that would be redundant? Nothing, but yeah, we're perfectly aligned on like their entire way of thinking. It it is a, it's a perfect (laughs) match. It's Um, so crazy. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And so what we're doing is we're encouraging people to do the education workbox in the summer. We're even having teacher camp. I'm so excited. So we're going to have teacher camp in July where you literally can create your entire administrative education workbox with all the paperwork organized that you're going to need for the entire year, create the checklist, create all of that. So that then during the school year, you can check this every week, but keep going on your planning and your lesson planning and refining your habits with Angela's program. And then we'll have a, um, co-working time where you can go through your administrative workbox. We are super excited to have our education workbox launched so we can really support educators this next school year. Yeah, I'm excited about it too. I think it's a, it's a, the two things together, I think are just going to really help teachers so much in terms of organization and time management. So Angela and I have been talking. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> hey, Angela. You want to talk again? She's like, what are you doing, Lisa? I'm like, here's what I'm thinking. What are you thinking? She's like, okay, yeah, I agree with that. So we kind of had a little uh, rant a couple of weeks ago. I think I started it. I was like, this is ridiculous. Teachers are drowning. Nobody's helping teachers. But Angela and I both have the same heart of like, teachers are going to go to the end of the earth for their students, no matter what. We do not have to encourage you in that. And we don't have to help you in that. You are going to have amazing lesson plans. You are going to meet the students that are in your classroom. We don't need to do that either. So all we're trying to do is say, hey, we were there where you were. We know that you are a person of excellence and there are all these requirements on your time and you're going to do them. And you're not going to say, I'm a contracted hour. I'm not doing it. You're not going to say that. (laughs) So the only thing we know to do 
is how can we help you have more time to either take that time that you get and pour it in even more to your lesson plans? Fine, run the whole school if you want to, or give that back to yourself or your community or your family. You do whatever you want to do with your time. We are yes. both just trying to give you time. So I want you to imagine if you do a Sunday basket, if you do Angela's 40 hour teacher work week, if you do the education work box, and any of those will give you five hours a week. That's five hours every week, you guys. It's not just five hours once. It is these systems and these habits that give back time over and over and over again. Imagine if you had 10 hours a week. Imagine if you had 15 hours a week. What would you do with this time? Like, it is a lot of time. It's a matter of one in 10 vested in their teachers. And I feel like every year that the attrition rate increases and then it becomes harder and harder to burn teachers out and just replace them with someone brand new. Um, I think this will become more of a priority. And I do see more and more leaders every single year who are doing an outstanding job, really tending to their teachers' well-being and caring about their work-life balance, setting expectations school-wide, letting parents know we don't respond to emails on the evenings or weekends. Your child's teacher will get back to you Monday morning. I definitely see things going in the right direction in many, many schools. <laughs> and that is super encouraging to me. And I hope that our programs can be a part of that because this is not something that schools have to figure out on their own. You and mm -hmm. I have already created systems. We've already tested yeah. it out with you know massive amounts of educators. These are programs that work already. And they're affordable. I mean, schools have professional yeah. development money and we are happy to work with uh, schools on purchase orders, on yep. grant money. Um, we do some, some help with as well. So, you know, get those title funds and we can tie this back to student impact because an organized, productive teacher who's focused on what matters most and has time for the things that are most impactful for kids and has the mental bandwidth to identify what those things are that are most impactful for kids absolutely impacts students. So I'm 100% convinced. Like every teacher who's gone through my programs has said, this has made me a better teacher. I'm, yeah. I, I do a better job. Not only do I have more energy for my kids, but I know what really matters for them. I know how yes. to plan the things and spend my time on stuff that actually makes a difference for them. Not one person has said, you know, I did this and it saved me time, but I feel like I'm really shortchanging my students or, you know, my test scores just bombed this year, or, you know what? My students didn't learn how to read this year because I didn't do anything. <laughs> That's not how this no, works at all. No, The people who invest their time and money into these programs are dedicated educators. If someone doesn't care about doing a great job for kids, they're never going to spend time and money on something. The people in these programs are people who are passionate. They love this work. They want to do a great job in this work. And they just need to know that it is possible that you don't have to work endlessly on nights and weekends in order to do a great job. Yeah. And we would love for you to share this podcast with anyone else, you know, that is a decision maker in education mm -hmm. or other people that might want to do this with you in education, because we know that these programs work when you buy them individually to help change your own life and move you from reactive to proactive and save your time and help make you a teacher that has more capacity and has more mental bandwidth and has less anxiety. Like we, we know that is a fact, but when the whole school or the whole grade level is working on the same system, these systems create a new language. Mm -hmm. Like Organize 365 now has, I think, 14 episodes of glossary because <laughs> I've created so many words for us to make the invisible work at home visible so we can have mm. a productive conversation so we can stop dusting every week and only do it every six weeks. Like, let's really look <laughs> at everything. Can you imagine if, if when you got your teaching job and you came in, they were like, okay, here's your teacher work box or your education work box. And here's your teacher 40 hour teacher work week login. Now we're going to give you your handbook. The handbook goes in the blue slash pocket. We're going to give you these forms for IEP and ESL kids. Those all go in red slash pocket so that when you have a team wide meeting and you're going to have a meeting about, I don't know, the uh, field trips you're going to take for the year, they're like, okay, everybody grab your orange slash pocket and bring, like, as a new teacher, you're like, okay, I need to find the orange slash pocket schedule. Here's how we've labeled them. Here's what we call these things. So much that is difficult for teachers when they're first starting out is what's the lingo of the building? Yes. What, you know, that handbook, literally, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, when you got the handbook, if you didn't turn it in, when you were done teaching, they deducted $10 from your paycheck. <laughs> you we had to remember where the handbook was. We did have was. to turn it back in. Yes. We did <laughs> have to turn school. it back in. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You have to turn it back in. 
Like, or like, what's your copy code? Like, great. Well, yellow is the folder that we always use to put your copies in and put your copy code on the outside. So you'll know, like, like just new teachers, they don't know where they're going to put their copy code or what, like they don't have any scaffolding. You would never have your third grade students come in and then just start giving them assignments without notebooks and pencils and a locker and a desk and a like, you give them all of the things. You're like, okay, everybody get your yellow notebook. We're going to start history. Now in a yellow notebook, I want you to head it this way. I want to make sure you have your paper this way. And you turn in, we don't do that with teachers. Mm. We're doing like, okay, you're going to come to the IEP meeting. <laughs> like, there's no, like, there's no, you see the what I'm saying? The structure's not there. We you know, I never why really would you thought do about that? it, Lisa, but you're yes. right. I mean, I've it's worked nuts. in offices before. Like my college job was like um, leasing apartments. And I remember like, that's my first time ever working in office. And I would, I sat down at the desk and they were like, here are these forms. Here's this form. Yes. When this person right. comes in, you do this. You put exactly. this over here. You run this like this. No. Like you would never just throw someone into an office yeah. job and be like, have a free for all with a stack of papers. You like, would. yeah, it is. It's actually kind of blowing my mind now that I think about it. It's not right. that I want to see you know, mandated micromanaging structures for teachers, but this idea that we have no system to give them, you know, system, figure out all these acronyms on your own, keep track of all this yes. online and physical paperwork. Yes. It, it, just, it is kind of mind blowing to me. Now. It's on the website. It's on the district website. Go find it. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. And then they reorganize the district website yes. and you didn't bookmark that page. And then like, so yeah. um, for the mastermind, the teachers that went through the mastermind to help us create the education uh, workbox, they said, here's the thing, either they were or weren't digital before COVID, everyone is digital now, even if they're back in person. But the problem is you go to log on to whatever the science platform is and the kid doesn't know what their password is. So these teachers had created password lists. They took student lists and then they'd be like science class. It'd be all the students and then all the students' passwords. So when the kid didn't remember, they're like, okay, your password is blah, blah, blah. And then they would tell them. And so they had these log books of all these passwords so they have to know their password to get into every program and all the students' passwords to get into all the programs, which is like already like eight different programs. Then there are the teacher programs, which are like another eight programs. That they, I'm like, this is why I'm a paper person. Are you <laughs> kidding me? They're like, yeah, we just finally just printed the, the weekend that I took and I made all the password lists for the kids. And some of you listening are going, oh, that's what I need to do. Yes, <laughs> that's what we're doing at teacher camp because this is the kind of stuff that 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 will save you so much time, but no one's telling people to do that. Mm. Like the kids don't remember their passwords. Like they don't, there's so much that you do and you just kind of react and you don't realize what you're reacting. And then in your grade level, what is everybody doing? Like you're probably already thinking, what is my co-teacher doing about that? Everyone in the last two years has figured out what they're doing when the kids forget a password and everybody's system is different. Mm -hmm. That's right. And you're but, never trained in what to do. No, it's just one of those things you're, you're expected to just figure it out on your own. Yes. And as a, a new teacher, you usually get as much information from the existing teachers that you know to ask the questions for. Mm -hmm. Hey, I was doing this. How do you do this? Teachers are glad to share with you, but they're not going to sit down and go like, okay, Monday at 8 a.m. I do this. And then at 8.05, like you'd have to literally shadow them to even know what questions to ask. So you don't even know what questions to ask. So you don't even know that they have a whole box full of forms and you don't have the box full of forms. And that's why you're always trying to find it. Yep. You don't know what you don't know. Please, for the love, give <laughs> the teachers the school supplies. They need the school supplies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Angela, I could talk with you forever. We did go over an hour. Angela saw my outline. She's like, oh, we could talk for a long time about this. I was like, don't test me. I talked to my sister for two and a half hours. I can talk for a long time when you get me on something that I'm passionate about mm. and education and teachers and are something that I'm very passionate about. So we, Angela and I are super, super excited to support anyone in the education field from moving reactive to proactive with the products and services we have. And we very much would love to partner with districts, buildings, private schools, whoever's looking to add this in, because both of our programs have a community component to it. Angela, do you want to share what supports go along with your, your 40 hour teacher work week? Yeah. So we have a discussion group for elementary teachers, um, which is generally K-5 in the U.S., and for secondary teachers, which is middle and high school, you can be in both if you teach both. And it's a place just to get support, to just bounce ideas off of other people to say, hey, I tried this and it didn't work. 
what, what am I missing? Or what else could I try instead? Or to say, I'm really struggling with this. What could I do? And also to share your successes. Yes. Um, you know, we, there are teachers who go in there a lot and it's, it's, it's a wonderful time to look back on what actually worked mm-hmm. and to have other people cheer you on when you're setting boundaries and you're saying no, and you're, you know, shifting your priorities. Not everybody gets that. And so to, to be with other people who have a like-minded uh, goals for themselves. I've consistently heard people say that's one of the most helpful parts of the program. It's just not feeling alone in what you're dealing with and also not trying to implement solutions alone and figure it out by mm-hmm. yourself. I mean, it was like you were just saying, you know, just now yeah. like this idea, it's just, it's bananas that like, we have to try to figure out like, how do I organize myself for an IEP meeting? Every individual <laughs> teacher is doing this completely on their own with no structure, no system, no support. It should not be like that. This should be something that districts yeah. are providing. And it should be something that is prioritized because teachers are wasting their time and yes. energy that could be spent on students trying to figure out where is my IEP paperwork, not because they're disorganized, but because they were never given structure and support. So yeah, and uh, if you're, obviously I could say a whole lot more. Yeah. And if you're going on more like a dollar per hour, let's say a teacher earned $25 per hour. Let's just say that that's what they earned per hour. Um, so if they took 17 hours of work time, that would be the same amount of dollars that you're spending for all these programs. So less than half your week of work to create all of this information that you're getting from Angela and I. So on the organized 365 side, we have an education work box group in the app, which has 90 minutes a week of co-working time during the school year with Sherry. Sherry's going to be running that for us. And then we have teacher camp in the summer. That is additional fee to do teacher camp. But that um, that app and that co-working time, that is something that is just going to go on and on and on and on because Angela and I, we're not going anywhere. (laughs) <laughs> we're not going anywhere. So we're here to support you guys going forward. Tell me Angela, about what people do during that co-working time. So we've already had it for the Sunday basket and for the business work box. And now we're going to add it for the teacher. So for Sunday basket, um, you take everything out for the week and then you open up all your mail and you go through all the notes you've given for yourself. And then they walk you through the basic five slash buckets. And then we have four more colors and they deep dive into one color each week for the month. The workbox group is run by Steph. And that one, again, same thing. Anything you've dumped in there for the week for your work, you go through all your notes, all your emails, and you put them in the right slash pockets, and then they deep dive into one color each month. And then for the education work box, because it's your administrative box, some of those are going to be set it and forget it for the year. And some of those you're going to go through on a regular basis. So Sherry will be figuring that out for us. <laughs> and it's done Love on... It. Um, it's done live in our app now. So we have a private app. Very cool. We created our own app and it is, it is so awesome. I love it so much. And for teachers, that's really helpful because they don't necessarily want everything on Facebook or any of those. We found that the community is a big, big part of what we offer at Organize 365. And even before the whole Facebook blow up, I was ready to do an app a long time ago uh, because we've always had some people who aren't on Facebook and then they weren't able to get into our our communities because that didn't really work with them. We also had 20% of our audience who had fake Facebook accounts just to be in our program. 20%. Mm. I was like, okay, this is nuts. So I was like, okay, I'll pay for the app because you know it's not an expense to them. We just pay for it because it is something that we pay to host. It's been great. It's been really, really great. So we love it. Are you on Facebook? So we actually offer both. Um, okay. We have a private message board forum okay. that is not connected to any social media for the people who yeah. do not want to be on social media. But we have our original Facebook group still going just because so many people find it the easiest. They already have accounts. They know how to do it. Yeah. They're already checking on a regular basis. So we actually have both yeah. and people can choose what they want. No organized 365 members. I'm not going back. That's what they would like. <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> the team's like, um, we're getting some requests. I'm like, no. So just so you know, that's not the team. It's Lisa who's been saying no. We do still have the free Organized 365 group and we have our professional organizers think tank group. Those are both over 10 years old that are on Facebook. I think Michelle's in there moderating those, but everything we do is pretty much inside of our app. It's so fun. I love it. That's amazing. That's yeah. goals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Angela, I like to employ people, so I need to have things for them to work on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me in this more than an hour long podcast. (laughs) Angela, is there anything else that you wanted to just say or share about your products or just anything? 
You know, I think the main thing that I want teachers to remember is that if you are struggling to do it all, it is not because you are bad at organization or you're bad at time management or you're not a good teacher or you're just not working hard enough. The job of a teacher is extraordinarily demanding. It has gotten harder. It's not just your imagination. It has gotten more demanding and the structures and supports are just not there. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you are struggling, know that you know, the problem is not you. The problem is that you need more support and the support mm-hmm. is available to you, not only through these programs, but also um, just reaching out to other educators and finding out how are they doing things? Stay in touch with other people and don't try to do all of this on your own because it can be a really isolating profession. You know, you're in your mm-hmm. classroom with your students the vast majority of the day, and you're not really getting to collaborate with other educators. So um, if you're struggling, you're not alone. And you don't have to figure out solutions alone. <laughs> and maybe most importantly, there are solutions. It is not yeah. a hopeless uh, profession where you are just destined to be miserable and you know working endless hours and constantly drowning in papers forever. Like there is hope. There are better ways. There are ways to make this a sustainable career choice and to feel like you're on top of things without working endlessly on your nights and weekends. So be encouraged. Yeah, we're just your teacher. We're just teachers, teachers. (laughs) I'm just teaching you how to organize the administration and Angela's teaching you how to organize the lesson. But like, we're literally just teachers for teachers. That's what we are. Mm -hmm. It's not that our way is better or you haven't figured out a way. I mean, a lot of people, eventually you have to figure out a way to do this on your own because it's not given to you. Mm -hmm. But if you have a system like Angela's or mine, where more than one teacher is doing it the same way, then it's easier to get people inside the whole building to do it the same way. I I guarantee there's 20, 30, 40% of your staff in the building are very organized seasons teachers who have figured out most of what Angela and I are teaching. They just are not also teaching it to you, but they figured it out on their own. Whereas these systems, if you put them in building wide, then everybody has the same, um, just the same vocabulary that, and it will ease the communication because not everyone is naturally organized to begin with. It's a learnable skill. And over time you develop it. Mm -hmm. Angela, thank you so much for joining us. You can find out about the organized 365 education workbox and Angela's 40 hour teacher work week by going to organize 